Good afternoon. My name is Professor Peter McLaughlin, and welcome to California Baptist University's Online and Professional Studies program. The class we'll be dealing with this semester is Business 358, which is Business Law. Uh, you'll find the class very interesting and very applicable to any field or form of business you go into. The textbook is Introduction to Business Law, Beatty and Samuelson. It's the fifth edition. If you need the ISBN number, it's 978-1-285-86039-8. What I'm going to try to do today is kind of give you an overview of the first chapter. Um, I believe I, you all by now have seen the PowerPoint I put together that gives you a little indication of what my background is. And um, this will be my seventh or eighth year that I've been teaching business law. I also teach strategic management. And as you saw in the PowerPoint, um, I'm also an entrepreneur, started a publicly traded company. So a lot of experience and hopefully I can share a lot of this with you as we go through the semester. Um, the chapter theme on the first chapter are that the principles discussed in this book are practical. Neither the book or the course is a theoretical exercise. So we have practical versus theoretical. The, the law definitely will affect you in every aspect of your life, and in particular in business, regardless of your career, whether or not you want it to or not. To more understand the to more or less understand the law better, the more you can use it for your own productive purposes, I think the safer your business will be. And one of the quotes I like to start out with at the, at the beginning of this semester, in particular this chapter, is one by James Madison who said, I believe there are more instances of the abridgment of the freedom of the people by gradual and silent encroachments of those in power than by violent and sudden usurpations. What he meant by this was, if the rule of the law isn't followed, if the Constitution isn't followed, you can end up destroying your government and destroying your country. Let's talk a little bit about the three important ideas about law that are mentioned in the first chapter. The first is power. Power affects nearly everything we do every day, at work, Employment law and contract law issues control how many hours we can work, conditions of the work environment, and even the matters of ownership of our ideas. In our leisure time, we deal with law through banking, copyright protection, and contracts. Remember that gym contract that you signed, maybe with 24-hour fitness or LA fitness? And the reality is a society cannot function without laws. Without laws, you have chaos and you have anarchy. How important is it? A society cannot function with laws. How do we find the laws? Is there a certain fascination? Absolutely. I feel that law is intriguing. Is it complex? Yes, it can be. Sometimes it's frustrating for you students, citizens, and even lawyers that the law has a tendency to be so complex. There are reasons for its intricacy. Anglo-American legal history consists in part of the clash of powerful, Competing interests such as ownership of property, ethics, raw power, business practices, personal responsibility, and the need for, for predictability. To understand the interplay of these forces to, is to see why the law is complicated. Let's move on to some of the key issues, complexity. Well, we already talked about that. How about action learning? From the newspaper article about a legal issue selected earlier, students should identify two or more competing interests. For example, in an article about a security suit, they should compare the right of an injured investor to seek compensation, and number two, the right of the corporation to be free of vexations litigation, and litigation. In an article about tobacco litigation, they might compare the tobacco company's property interest in a profitable commodity, the company's obligation to divulge what they knew concerning nicotine, the personal responsibility of those who, who have chosen to smoke, 
and the state's interest in reducing medical costs for companies, the right to free speech, i.e. advertising, the federal government's interest in regulating smoking and the state's obligation to protect children. The more important the legal issue, the less likely it is that there is a simple solution that will make everyone happy. At the conclusion of the discussions, sometimes it makes sense to kind of summarize the points, which, which is what we will do, and we'll talk about it, in particular the case that was assigned for you for this you know, first week during the semester. Student discussion is obviously important, and it's something that I value. So I encourage you to think freely and to, and to join in the discussions. Let's look at some of our sources of law. One of the sources of contemporary law is the United States Constitution, Constitution, which I feel is the most valuable, important document that's ever been created in the history of the world. It's the supreme law of the land for us here in the United States, and it establishes the federal government and distributes powers among the federal and state governments, as well as individual citizens. It also creates a system of checks and balances among the branches. You have the legislative power. power. They have the ability to create new laws. It is balanced by executive power of the veto and judicial power of interpretation and determination of validity. So let's talk about the three powers. The executive power, which usually lies with the President of the United States, is the ability to enforce laws. It is balanced by the legislative power to override a veto and to impeach and the judicial power to interpret. Let's look at the judicial arm. The judicial power is the power to interpret laws and determine their validity. It is balanced by the executive power to appoint justices and legislative power to approve justice nominees. Congress can also amend the Constitution with the approval of all 50 states. Another source of contemporary law is statutes. The Constitution gives the Congress the power to pass laws on various subjects. A proposed law is called a bill. A bill that has become a law is called a statute. In law, we have what we, or in the legal system, we have what we call the common law. And the common law is the collective body of court decisions throughout history that make up the common law. Judges of all courts below the Supreme Court will refer to previous cases to rule on present cases. The principle that precedence is binding on later, later cases is called stare decisis, which is a Latin term meaning let the decision stand. How about court orders? We've all heard about court orders. Sometimes judges issue court orders on a particular person or entity. This may be in order to do something or in order to refrain, let's say, from certain actions. Then we have, a little farther down the ladder, we have administrative law. And administrative agencies are created by Congress or by an order of the President. Their purpose is to carry out the day-to-day -day work of enforcing the statutes passed by Congress. Agencies have the power to create regulations which are as binding as any of the laws. Now I'd like to move into the classifications of law. First of all, you have criminal and civil law. Most law is civil law. Most law depicted on television is criminal law. Therein lies a challenge for many students. Civil law does not involve guilt or punishment, the two concepts that television law endlessly portrays. Breach of a contract is civil law. It's a civil issue and therefore does not involve guilt or punishment. If the plaintiff wins, the defendant must pay compensation. With criminal law, society outlaws behavior that proves threatening to the whole populace. Arson is dangerous because it costs lives, destroys property, and drives up insurance costs. Civil law is different. Let's say the breach of a contract does not threaten the fabric of society and no prosecutor will seek to jail that particular person. Yet, an injured party is entitled to compensation. With, with civil law, society establish, establishes certain ground rules. Sorry, my cell phone went off. Apologize for that. Um, with civil law, 
Uh, basically, uh, let's see, lost my train of thought here. Let's go backwards. Criminal law society outlaws behavior that pro proves threatening to the whole populace. Arson is, danger, is dangerous because it costs lives. It also destroys property and drive up insurance costs. Civil law is different. The breach of contract does not threaten the fabric of society, and no prosecutor will seek to jail that particular person. Yet an injured party is entitled to compensation. With civil law, society establishes certain ground rules that requires the party themselves, the parties themselves, to basically resolve the disputes. And here we get into a section of the course that's particularly applicable for those of us that are faculty and students at California Baptist University, and that's the area of law and morality. Law and morality are clearly different, yet obviously re related. How should a citizen respond to a law that seems immoral? What are students' reactions to controversy, let's say, surrounding Prop 187 in California? A high school principal refused to comply with the law because he considered it unethical. The text supplies several bullet points responding to the principal's statement with which argument students agree or disagree. So in law, particularly, well, I'll say in civil law and criminal law, morality is obviously uh, a huge issue. And by morality, we mean the ability to define right from wrong. And obviously, we always want to do right. We'll also, through the semester, talk about contractual relationships and, walk, and work through contract law. But for right now, let's just stick on these initial key points. The one case that you were assigned this week, I believe, was Saldana versus O'Daniels. So it would be good to look into that case, come to some sort of discussion or conclusion, and then we'll discuss the case online. But for now, that's it for Chapter 1. If you have any questions, please email me. I'll be happy to answer your questions. And I look forward to working with you the rest of the semester. Take care, have a good day, and God bless.